This is synchronicity. 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 Welcome to episode 16 of Synchronicity. My um, guest today is Kelly Carlin. I also have a cold, so I'm going to keep this pretty uh, short. Uh, I was up in New York the past few days and had a great time. Uh, had some cool guests on the podcast, did some in-person ones, which are great. Um, <clears throat> but I also got a cold up there, so that wasn't so great. So rather than you listen to my sick voice for this, uh, you know, typical 5-10 minute intro, I'm just going to give you the DL, the down low on Kelly Carlin. Um, Kelly is the daughter of George Carlin, legendary comedian and counterculture figure, uh, one of my favorite comedians. Um, But more importantly, Kelly is incredibly interesting and smart and wise in her own right, Um, has a degree, got her master's in Jungian depth psychology, um, studied at Pacifica. She's a huge Joseph Campbell fan. Um, and more importantly, just really seems to dive into what the heck are we doing here on earth? What are we doing? She's, she's looking for meaning and more importantly, um, seems to have a pretty balanced view, um, of the world. She doesn't, she, she says something in this episode where she says, you know, whenever we too heavily look at something from one side, she's always fundamentally interested in what is being overlooked on the other side. So this equanimity or this balance concept uh, is peppered out throughout this entire discussion. Um, We talk about a bunch of other things too. Um, We talk about the concept of the shadow, um, which is kind of uh, something that in, at least in the new age movement, I think is overlooked quite a bit. Everyone is kind of into this whole positive thinking. Everything is love and light. And, And yes, everything is love and light, but there's also aspects of ourselves and our culture in the world at large, that is dark and not so great. And I think if we overlook those things, we're doing ourselves a a tremendous disservice. Um, So we go into that. Um, We talk about Twitter, where I actually met Kelly. We talk about spiritual awakenings, the value of intuition. Um, Kelly also mentions this very cool concept of horizontal versus vertical um, and how we can make so many connections via this horizontal kind of paradigm, um, but they don't have a ton of depth to them also, always. So she, she kind of uh, makes this uh, juxtaposition between horizontal and the vertical. Um, very, very cool. Uh, I re-listened to that part um, because it was very interesting. Um, she also mentions uh, Lucinda Williams' new album. I asked her what she's been listening to, and she's been listening, or she hadn't gotten to it yet, but she's going to listen to it, The Ghost of Highway 20. So I have a link on that on the podcast page. As you can tell, I am on cold medicine. I am not my usual jolly self, um, but this episode is great, so I don't want you to overlook that. Um, as all, hey, Also, I really, the reviews and ratings have been coming in, and I really, these things, they're so nice to read. Um, eh, I love it. So please, uh, if you haven't given a rating or review on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever you listen in on, um, I really would appreciate that. So that's awesome if you do that. If not, no biggie. Still cool. We're still cool. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to ramble on because my voice can't take it. But without further ado, here is Kelly Carlin. <laughs> Um, thank you, by the way, for doing this. Uh, I really appreciate it, um, and I'm excited to actually have you on for a lot of reasons. Um, so thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm always excited to talk to people uh, about the topics that you and I are obsessed with. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I had, we'll just start, just no real intro here. I'll put an intro before this. Um, you know, one of the things, I had seen you actually pop up. Uh, I, I refer to Twitter as like, just like digitized consciousness. And it's like, to me, it's like a, a new form of communication where people don't have that filter that typically goes through their brain, through their mouth. Like it's <laughs> circumvented. So now like people like, cause you see the same things I must see on Twitter, like people bearing their souls sometimes people losing yeah. their minds, just like some there. I admittedly, when I first got on, 
I was like uh, early 20s, mid 20s. And I was, you know, a single person in New York getting drunk. And some of the tweets I put out, I'm like, oh, my God, like, I can't believe it. (laughs) And I see people still doing it. But uh, one of the first things not having anything to do with drunken tweets, I saw you come through. um, I work with Upaya Zen Center. And a yes. long time ago, must not a long time ago, maybe like two years ago, I saw you mention Upaya and I was like, oh, who's, and you were tweeting some really interesting things. And I was like, oh, this is uh, George Carlin's daughter. She seems to be really into this. And so I just started following from afar. Um, and then recently, I don't know exactly how, but I got tuned into you again on Twitter, started following you and immediately was like, wow, this person <laughs> is awesome. Like this is uh, a... <laughs> Great Aww. follow. Yeah. And then I did a little more research and found out you actually have your master's degree in Jungian depth psychology. And I am, I couldn't be more of a Carl Jung fan. And I, I don't know if you have this experience, but very rarely do I come across people who are big Carl Jung fans. Like most people don't even really know who he is in my world. True. So whenever very I, true. Yeah. So whenever I find someone I'm like, yeah, they kind of know something. So I really, I got to say, it's just been a pleasure to getting to know you, you know, just digitally. Um, so I'm very excited. So, um, yeah, I'd love to start there. Can you, for let, let's assume no one knows anything about Carl Jung and they know nothing okay. about, you know, anything related to his dream stuff or anything. Can you give a brief explanation um, of, you know, why you got your degree there and what interested you in the subject? Yeah, so um, I've always been a seeker uh, and was uh, in my 20s dabbling a lot in like the more magical thinking aspects Mm. of the New Age movement (laughs) (laughs) and was a uh, uh, like, you know, a person who went a lot to the Bodhi Tree bookstore, which in L.A. was the spiritual bookstore um it was the place to be shirley mclean was like one of my heroes and um so i was always been a seeker always been looking for like what is this enlightenment thing and how do i get out of my misery and all that kind of stuff and um and then uh lots of life changes in my 30s got more grounded in all sorts of ways in my life and then my mom died uh when i was 34 in 1997 and i had like this profound awakening. Mm. And p- part of it was an, an actual physical experience mm-hmm. of uh, an incredible connection to a sense of love and oneness around my mother's death, which was yeah. the last thing that I thought I would feel <laughs> if I died. Yeah, because yeah. I was really convinced that I was going to be like, you know, put on major drugs and yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, Both, yeah. put into a rubber room at UCLA. Yeah. And part of that awakening too was like, holy shit. Um, this thing, this love thing is profoundly real and it's a physical real experience. It's not an idea. It's not an abstract concept of what I'd been reading in books for years. And, and the other thing about my mother's death was this kind of, you know, shit or get off the pot kind of attitude like, Oh, death is real and people go away. And, I want to be able to sit with death. And, you know, we didn't handle my mom's death or her dying very, very consciously in my family. And, yeah. and part of my yearning had always been to go to a Zen Buddhist retreat, which mm-hmm. I just was fascinated by it all, but had like spent maybe five minutes meditating in my life right, because right. I had like anxiety disorder and all sure. this stuff. So <clears throat> I, went to a Zen retreat and was intrigued by that. And actually that's when I saw Joan Halifax. Oh, of Oh, She's the best. <laughs> For the very first time she was leading this group of people talking about death. And I sat like kind of on the outskirts of this kind of group out under a tree and yeah. wasn't really ready to face it all, but was right. fascinated by her. Oh my God. And yeah. she's just this glowing, <laughs> amazing human. And um, so anyway, I, you know, I've always wanted to pursue that, but I also wanted to pursue my art. And so I tried to do, I started to do a one person show. It didn't work out. Anyway, I knew that I wanted to, a couple of things that had happened to me in those years between my mom's death and going to Pacifica was that, and Pacifica is where I went to get my master's right, and study right. Joseph Campbell mythology and uh, Carl Jung psychology. Love it. And part of it was that I wanted to be able to stand up in front of people 
and talk about my own life in a way that revealed my humanity and revealed all of our humanity. And, and I also wanted to be able to understand, like, how did I get here? How did I get to where I was? Because I'd had a very colorful and interesting journey up until that point, which I, I write about in my, in my memoir. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so I really wanted to understand about the shaping of the human psyche. How do we become who we are? And, and because of Pacifica had Joseph Campbell's archives on the premises, which for me was like, like that's incredible. Like, yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's like my <laughs> treasure trove of amazingness. My, no. it, it'd be like where I would do my pilgrimage to, you <laughs> yeah. know? Yeah. It's so awesome. And, uh, and then they focus on Carl Jung and then, and uh, so, and I was intrigued by Carl Jung. I didn't know a lot about him, but mm. I do, re- you know, one of the things I knew was that um, he talked about archetypes mm-hmm. and, and this thing called the shadow. Yeah. And I had just, you know, after my mother's death really is when my adulthood started. It's mm-hmm. really when I started to kind of grow up in lots of different ways and try to extricate myself from the enmeshment of my family mm-hmm. on a mental level and, and, and physical levels too. Sure, sure. Um, and I remember my therapist out during that time at some point who had mentioned to me like, you know, well, that's part of your shadow material. Mm-hmm. And I was one of those people, which I think there are most of the people on the planet go shadow. (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) I'm I'm perfectly lovable and fabulous. There's no part of me. (laughs) I mean, I mean, I work with, you know, spiritual organizations and, you know, I am inundated with new age type stuff. I mean, there's a, there's, I don't want to call an epidemic, but there is this kind of positive thinking movement that I think completely, overlooks yes. this critical part of our psyche which is i mean talk about the problems in the world where they come from i think a lot of them have to do with people not even knowing that this exists um, uh, i yes a hundred percent and so for me it's like learning about the shadow and that the shadow like i assumed the shadow was like like the darkest you, you know and it is mm, of course mm. it can be the darkest parts of ourselves i mean the way i love the best description of it that I've ever heard is Robert Bly has an essay about the long bag we drag behind us. Mm. And he talks about how at the beginning of life, you know, the first time we're told no, or when you're too big and someone says, you know, calm down or don't be so big or don't laugh so hard or stop running around or whatever it is, we take that part of ourselves and we put it in a bag. And we say that part is not lovable and it's not acceptable by society because that's what our parents are basically doing. They're trying to make sure that we're going to get along out there and that we're going to be able to survive and succeed. So they, they know they have to shape us. So we start putting all these parts of ourselves in there. And some of them are the darker things like our rage, you know, murderous rage, of course, yes, you know, yes. it could be our sexuality, you know, sure. our lust. Um, But it could also be positive aspects of ourselves, our creativity, our liveliness, our joy, you know, whatever it is that we have to kind of shudder away in order to make do in our family. And that becomes our shadow material. Mm. And the basic concept that Jung, you know, kind of introduced to the world, well, Freud was the first one. I mean, the reason it's called depth psychology is because it's about that there's an un- there is an unconscious, both right. a per- right. personal unconscious and a collective unconscious, and so Freud introduced the concept, and then and then really Jung is the one who brought the archetypes in and 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 the importance of the shadow that it wasn't just all sexual, right, physical, right, right. instinctive things, right, but that we kind of all share this this many of these archetypes and uh, you know that uh, that kind of fill up our mythology and our stories mm-hmm. and all. And, and they all live in the unconscious. And when you're unconsciously in relationship with all of that stuff, it actually runs you yeah. more well, than your conscious story does. So, so, so and what's crazy about so I so, became um, a big fan of Marie Louise von Franz, who was mm-hmm. uh, his main translator. And 
Uh, she wrote an excellent book that I'm still reading because this is not something you can plow through called Psyche and Matter. And yes. it's the fundamental relationship between inner and outer and how these things manifest. And part of the reason this show is called Synchronicity is because um, at various points in my life, um, in various, you know, uh, forces, uh, synchronicity has been an omnipresent thing um, in a lot of different ways. And Jung described it as a very weird way of putting it, but an acausal pattern of order, orderedness. Yes, it, it's a, you know, and this is this is partially why I think he's not understood so well, or he's not known is like, if someone picks up a book of his, it is hard to read. Like there is no, there's yes. no other way to put it, but it is dense, heavy, kind of crazy stuff. Um, I do love the way that Marie-Louise von Franz, though, she talks about um, how what happens on the inside actually changes the outside world. And she goes into this in detail in a variety of ways. And to me, that always made a lot of sense because I'd experienced it. And I think if you take you know, enough psychedelics in the right set and setting, you can also experience that. Um, but to me, that was always something that was fascinating, that what we do internally could actually have ramifications outside of the obvious, just like, well, if I'm in a better mood, I'm going to be nicer to other people. And that's going to create, you know, a nicer yeah. situation, which we all kind of understand. But there are things that keep us from that. And the actual changing your internal kind of reaction or way of interacting with the world really does have a substantial impact in a microcosmic and macrocosmic way, which to me is yeah, fascinating. Uh, absolutely. And, and I, and I, you know, it's really interesting these days with, you know, brain science and neuro research and consciousness research and everything, you know, and how they're trying to, you know, that like Jung was, you know, he was very intuitive and his writing is hard and dense yeah. because he's, you know, he's trying to put words and language to things that no one had ever languaged <laughs> before. All, ever. At all. Ever. ever. <laughs> you know, and but if you read his memoir, yes, and 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 if you if you look at the Red Book and kind of yeah. look at people talk about the Red Book now, and the Red Book was Young's time in his life. Oh man, when he basically had a psychotic breakdown <laughs> yeah. and used his imagination and what he called active imagination yeah. process, where he interacted with these inner figures. Yeah. And through drawing and painting and also building, because he yeah, built this structure, stone yeah. structure <laughs> on the coast of this lake he lived on. Yeah. Um, so cool. He reorganized himself. I mean, yeah. psychotic breakdown means that it's just like it's pure chaos in there. Yeah. And yeah. he reorganized himself. And it was through that self reorganization that he discovered all of this insight he had about the psyche and how it works. Yeah. And then he then he tried to translate it into those huge collected works volumes. Just you know, and then here we are now a hundred years later, you know, or almost a hundred years later, um in a post Jungian time yes, yes. where people are, you know, still trying to translate and understand and 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 even move beyond him too, because he, he was from a very particular time, Absolutely. a very particular culture. He was, you know, uh, in, uh, you know, constant battle with Freud. Absolutely. You know, there was a lot of issues going on there. Um, so it's, it is, it's, it's deep, dense stuff. And I think for me, like, thank God for Pacifica, because mm. being able to enter into some of those concepts. And there are some great people who have interpreted his concepts. Yes. Um, June Singer has a book about Jung and all of his concepts where she really lays them out nicely mm -hmm. for you. Um, Robert Johnson is another one. Yeah. Thomas Moore. Yeah. Um, uh, who's the other guy? James Hollis. A huge fan of James Hollis. He's got these little thin little books that he writes. Cool. He's a, he's a great interpreter and, uh, translator of these concepts. Yeah. I and, just, and, yeah, they're so great. Yeah. They're, it, it, to me, it is, I, I, I've noticed the same thing that I think a lot of people who interact with it, once you get to the meat or just kind of the concepts of what was going on, the red book is insane. Like I, yeah. that is to me, I mean, let alone like let's just take it from an artistic standpoint like the guy right. was brilliant like this yeah. is insane and it's no no doubt that he was tapping into this deep rooted stuff and that's we're going to resonate with that um but the concepts that he kind of touched upon 
like you said, we're still unraveling some of these things. But what I love about it is quantum physics, all of these really at the forefront breakthrough of, you know, science, they line up with everything that he was saying. There's no like fundamental split of what was going on in terms of how consciousness interacts with matter and all of these things that seem impossible, but yet are happening and we observe them. Um, it's just like a and fast. We, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we still don't quite understand oh. it. I mean, I think you know, we're still trying to find the scientific, la I mean, languaging around it. We were just right. starting to have this conversation, you know, and there's a lot of materialists out there who, you know, want it all, and it may be all brain-based, but for me, it's like, it doesn't matter whether it's right. all brain-based or matter-based or not. Um, you know, like you said, when you get an insight and shift a perspective inside of you, mm. not only does your does your experience of the world change? Mm. But then your interaction with the world changes, which, like you said, then really does change the world because that's how it works. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> how it works. That's it's through the interaction that we actually make a different experience of things. And, um, yeah, you know, like, yeah, go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it, it's really interesting for me because one of the, Things like when I got my master's, I got my master's in counseling psychology, which meant that I could go and become a therapist I wanted mm. to, if I wanted to. And I really knew I didn't want to be a therapist. Sure. I, I really, you know, I, I tried it for a few years and it was great and interesting, but it's, it's not my path. And I knew sure. that I wanted to be out in the world being able to kind of use this depth psychology filter mm. to look at the greater cultural things that were going on and phenomena that were going on to try to understand them in a deeper way and to try to help people understand like what's going on. You know, I mean, you just look at politics right now. You're clear literally. So I have a list of questions that I like to do a little research before I talk to people just as like, you know, barometers and to check in. So I have a list broken up of cultural questions, personal questions, numinous questions, and you're literally plucking them through. Like I have cycles <laughs> of news media, role in culture, politics. So yeah, just you, you keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and so, you know, and, and I'm, and I don't pretend to be an expert or anything, but, sure. and, and it's been interesting. I mean, the last seven years, I haven't had a lot of chance to do this kind of stuff. I've been kind mm -hmm. of on a different journey. Mm -hmm with my father and my family story yeah, and, yeah. and all sorts of things. Yeah. But I really feel like I've like kind of come out and I just was at Pacifica two weekends ago and mm. was deepening back into the, uh, the archetypal psychology perspective with, which is James Hillman. Mm. And, and one of the things we were talking about was how there is, you know, this fascination with the horizontal in our culture that, you know, especially with the internet, I mean, the internet is all about web and connection mm. and network. And this is all a big horizontal thing. Yeah. And, and, and then with horizontal, you also get quicker, shallower encounters with yes, people. Yes, yes. Which is, um, yeah. Talk which about is interesting it. because like you and I found each other because of the horizontal. Right. right. But here we get to have this hour together where we exactly get to go deep, you know, and but but just how how kind of really obsessed we are with this uh, this horizontal aspect and that as a depth psychologist i mean the word is right there <laughs> in what i call myself yeah, yeah you know the depths are important and to be able to slow people down to to be connected to a moment to connect to their depths whether it's their feeling in their body their somatic experience mm. their intuition um, to get in touch with their unconscious or their imagination, right. you know, like all these things, you know, there's a, there's an imbalance and there has been an imbalance in the modern age, obviously mm. around this stuff. Um, but you know, it's like, I, I feel like that's part of my job as a depth psychologist is to come into a conversation. And I mean, it's why I did my, why I do my solo show right. and why I, wrote my memoir. I mean, it was really great when I was at Pacifica a couple of weekends ago, mm. uh, this woman, Jennifer Selig, she's amazing. She's a archetypal psychologist and she, I got up in front of everyone and I started, I was talking about my passion for the world and how I'm like, you know, how I love to sit in my house and think about my thoughts and mm. all this kind of stuff. But part of me really also wants to go out in the world right. 
because I see how the world is suffering. And I started to cry. And I looked around the room and I said, I really wasn't planning on crying. <laughs> and Jennifer said to me, yeah, but you're an extroverted feeler. Mm. That's your job mm. is to take us to an emotional place publicly so that we can slow down and actually feel what's going on in our world. So talk about the broader context of this is I look at this. So here's where I think we are culturally as a civilization right now. I think we're caught in the middle of a few interesting paradigms. One is this rapid increase of technology, right? This just insane, you're talking about the horizontal, the connectedness, quick connectedness is just, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, the bell curve is shot to shit. We're going up, you know, uh, exponentially, like I said. The other thing that I think is happening is I, I really sense this intuitively and I have for probably going on, you know, over a decade. I am fundamentally sensing at the structure of what rules our archetypal world um, at large that the paternal structures that have been in place for 2000 plus years, 2500 plus years, if not longer, um, are beginning to break down or have been breaking down and we're finally beginning to see the cracks of kind of this new not new but a return to this kind of feminine consciousness this female consciousness that is slowly starting to creep in creep in and i i fundamentally view um what's interesting is I like Buddhism or a concept in Buddhism called the union. And I admittedly do not understand this as well as I probably should to be speaking about, but the union of emptiness and bliss. And to me, I always looked at it, you know, at least in the Vedic terms of the emptiness is the inherent wisdom that would come from like the father archetype. And the bliss is what is comes out of, you know, what uh, Vedic, places would call shakti right, uh, right. The feminine consciousness the active the worldly stuff and sure. i sense that that's slowly starting to come back into the world so these things are being spoken about in a more meaningful way by more people and i've just noticed that over the past 10 15 years yes. maybe it's a product of me growing up but i really sense it's a cultural shift so i am i'm, I'm trying to figure out I think it's going to a good place, but also the balancing act between that and these kind of archaic structures that still, let's face it, rule the Western sure. world at the very sure. least and starting to rule the rest of the world. That's kind of the dynamic and interplay that I'd see going on. And I always like to look at just as we have personal, you know, anima and animus and uh, shadow aspects. So do all structures, systems do. And I... I really feel like we're at a point, and I think podcasting is part of this, and I think just other media outlets... I think we have a real opportunity to shift consciousness in a positive way, not to get people to do things like a certain way, but to just bring more awareness and or compassion and kindness into things and still realize like it's going to be OK. Like if you do that, you're not weak, you're not soft, it's not going to be bad for everyone. But to be more accepting and tolerant of other people's viewpoints is actually like a really good thing to do for not just ourselves, but everyone. Um, and that's just kind of what I sense is going on that with this rapid amplification of technology and communication, we also see the, da the what you're talking about too. these superficial, very quick transient moments of reaction that seem to be amplified through this kind of like echo chamber of the internet or social media. So to me, what I'm interested in, and this is why I love your approach to this with death psychology is, uh, looking it through a lens that can actually kind of frame what everyone is seeing going on, but in a way that can be productive. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I love talking and seeing people like you, because I see your tweets, like I see your political tweets, and you, you're you funny, and you're, you know, everyone should call Ted Cruz what he is, and I think we all do on Twitter, but you have a way of approaching it with a tenderness and kind of like mm -hmm. a kindness that isn't lost on me, at least. You know, mm -hmm. someone may see that and just be like, ah, liberal, blah, blah, blah. But, <laughs> right. you know, I can sense the difference between someone who's like buying into the news cycle, whatever side they're on, and someone who's like, really, there's a way to look at this that I think is beneficial for everyone. So Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's hard with 140 characters, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, everything that motivates me is holding the tension of the opposites. Mm. Everything. That's mm. completely where I'm motivated from. So, mm. you know, I it's got that from your book too, right? I mean, this is we'll talk about your your memoir too. I mean, that's it's I really want to get into that, but that that makes sense, you know, psychologically yeah. how you grew yeah. up. So Com yeah. Completely, completely. Yeah. And and so for me, it's about always questioning, you know, where is 
when there's too much focus and energy on one side, what are we leaving out on the shadow mm. side? What's, you know, what, where's the shadow of it? Mm. And, you know, and there's, you know, the, it's really about balance for me. Balance is everything. And, mm. and balance, not for the sake of being of like making everything vanilla and wishy-washy <laughs> right. and compromising to the point where there's really nothing to stand for. But it's that thing that's created, that third thing that is created when you really, when you do hold the tension of the opposites. There's a third way that is created. And it can only be created when you hold the value of both things equally. Right. You know, so that when you hold the, the value of what it means for the conservatism or what you could call the, um, you know, like the, uh, the cynics. Uh, mm. archetype, mm. you know, that which is tradition, mm. and the puer, which is progress and mm. growth and youth right. and right. movement. Right. When you hold both of those things equally, they both have an essential part of the conversation to be had in every moment in our lives, right. individually and collectively. Mm. Same thing with horizontal and vertical. If you get, if you're only in the vertical, in the depths, yeah. you know, you're going to get you're not going anywhere and misconnections with other people yeah yes, yes okay. not going anywhere you are yeah. staying in one place and you're going up and down your own little <laughs> i love this elevator I love this wow. right right but if but you know but if you're only on the horizontal then you're you're never stopping to really check in with yeah. what is needed now you know hmm. and and then you know like the difference between like this other kind of archetype that's really possessed which is really about the American dream and capitalism, which is this titanism, you know, this never ending sense of uh, power and growth yeah. and everything's got to be bigger. <laughs> yeah, more <laughs> of it. Yeah. More of it. And, you know, and all of that. And and that leaves very little room. And, and it's very... Um, he, heroic male heroic right. type of energy where there's there's nothing for the feminine in that you know right. it doesn't allow and it right it doesn't allow for you know the the sense of soul place uh quiet ritual the body right. you know the 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 culture leaves out the body i mean no wonder we're all sick and obese <laughs> well we don't even what always blows my mind and i am guilty of this as much as anyone else uh but how we don't really recognize you know the father of western medicine you know the hippocratic oak hippocrates is like you are what you eat like what you put in your body yes! is what you're going to be and we everyone's all, like we what all do you mean <laughs> Exactly. We all have eating disorders right. because we're not really feeding ourselves I anything. I, I mean, as a woman, I'm constantly assessing my relationship with food and yeah. my body and my looks and all that kind of stuff and really trying to like find like a new way, a new relationship with all of that because yeah. it's like, what, what, you know, because I, I am an emotional eater. I've learned how yeah, to do that too. at yeah. a young age, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, so yeah, so all of these things though, you know, but, but if you're only into the soul and the more, f and that, that more feminine aspect of body, emotion, soul, all that kind of stuff, you know, then, you know, you could, you, you know, you're, you're not going to probably go out and discover uh, the next biggest invention in the world. You know? right, <laughs> because it's going to be a not... more receptive, you know, yes. the more yin part of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so there's this real interesting beautiful balance that we need and so i'm always trying to just bring a little balance a little recognition of you know no matter what i see as insanity out there mm. i try to hold that well you know here's the real cause of it you know you can call ted cruz or donald trump all you really you know what you want right. but here's the wounding here's the mm. thing that we're trying to in an unconscious way heal in ourselves or manage or balance in some way in our culture and uh you know and and, I, and i'm just trying to figure this out as we go along just like everybody else well, you know i was gonna say like how what are some tips and i don't expect uh, you don't have to give me like the answer here but <clears throat> what are some ways that you personally cultivate that perspective 
or outlook like i i've been meditating this month because uh sharon salzberg's doing this 28 day meditation challenge which is the only time in my life i meditate four weeks in a row (laughs) it's like literally and i am immersed in this stuff all day long and i have plenty of opportunities to meditate with amazing people um but i don't and i'm trying to figure out why i don't and sometimes i know it has to do with accountability but that's one of the techniques i do i do some chanting Uh Um, I'll take psychedelics once in a while and plunge a little deep and see what I can pull back, if anything. Um, but what, what, uh, I smoke a lot of weed, <laughs> um, but what, what are some things that you do to cultivate this kind of outlook or perspective so you can hold that space in what is admittedly like a very turbulent and kind of like, you know, there's a lot going on in the world out there. Yeah, well, one of the, I mean, I, you know, and I don't have a proper meditation practice myself, mm. but I do find that when I do meditate 10 to 20 minutes a day mm. for a bunch of days in a row, life goes a lot better. Yeah, fascinating. Weird, right? That's why don't we how that do looks. it then if we yeah. know that's what I'm but, trying to do? That's the thing. I mean, that's yeah. the, you know, the why don't we is, yeah. I mean, that's always the big, you know, and yeah. one of the, and one of the ways I've helped to navigate my why aren't I doing that mm. or really is, and it's why my, uh, um, it's why my company's called Polymind and why my name here on Skype is Polymind. Yeah. Um, it's because, uh, you know, I really do believe that we are the, the 10,000 voices and that we, we are a Polymind. We have many perspectives within us. And one of the techniques I use, um, it's kind of an active imagination technique, but it's called voice dialogue. Mm. And, Part of the structure I use it with, and really got trained in to do it with a, a little, a lot of ease and and kind of deftness, mm. is I work with a gentleman named Gempo Roshi, mm. who created something called the Big Mind Process, which helps you use voice dialogue to walk right into the mind of the Buddha. Mm. And it was really the first time in my life, and I got introduced him to him through Ken Wilber and his integral sure, stuff like sure. ten years ago, cool. when Ken was first putting out all those little five to ten minute little audio yeah. things, and Integral was really uh, the community of Integral was becoming yeah. an official thing, and there yeah. was a website and all of that, and I really got involved in the Integral philosophy and Ken Wilber's stuff, which I also find is brilliant and mm. really, really visionary. Um, it helps kind of put a lot of the pieces together, especially around value systems and right. red versus blue versus green and all that kind of stuff. He's it's really it's it's a great way to look filter to look at the culture. Yeah, uh, so it's another tool I use. But this voice dialogue thing's amazing. Mm-hmm. And and Gempo, um, when you go to work with him, like over a weekend, he works with a lot of the ego based voices: the voice oh. of fear, the voice of the controller. The voice of the wounded child, the voice of um, the voice of anger, the voice of lust. I mean, just all sorts of emotions and different archetypes he works with. And you, 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 and you sit in your seat, and he'll ask to speak to. Let me speak to the voice of the controller, which is usually the first one he talks to because he knows if he doesn't speak to the voice <laughs> of the controller, yeah. We ain't getting anywhere in this process. <laughs> sure. And, you know, and it's great. And it helps you to, like meditation, to learn to see yourself, mm. Kelly, in my, in my case. I would talk about myself in the third person when I'm doing the work, when I'm in another voice, because you start to see that this construct of a personality is just that. It's a construct. Right. I mean, we know that, right? I mean, yes, I, 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 but I, yeah. really, really feel it. Like when you're in the voice of the controller and he'll say, how does the self feel about you as the controller? And you speak as the controller and you're like, well, she doesn't like me at all. Mm. I mean, you know, she, she doesn't like when I try to control her and everything, but she likes me when I try to control other people, you know, I think. And so it's, you really get to see this relationship. And so that has helped me mm a lot to be able to detach from aspects of myself right. and to a to to look at them from the outside and to step into them mm. and to really hear why are they here what do they need well that is great right. with the perspective you can get from that by i mean cuz it is like you're saying a little bit like meditation where you're watching the discourses of these separate parts of yourself cuz like i yes. 
I mean, anyone yeah. who's taken psychedelics or done enough meditation, you realize that who we like to think of as ourselves, Noah, Kelly, is just an aggregate of all of these exactly. and interlocking things. But I like what this does too, is it gives you a perspective to step into it, yes. which is very, very valuable for just like cultivating different perspectives on situations. And That's cool. The reason he brought, he created this is because he's been, he's a Zen master and he's mm. been in the Zen world for 40 years. Mm or maybe 50 years. Um, and he saw that there was no work on the shadow, mm. just like Ken Wilber talks about. Right. There's, And this is what you talked about being in the spiritual communities where it's yes. a lot of positive thinking. Yeah. Um, they call it spiritual bypass is what yes, they call it. Exactly. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. And, and basically Gempo said, you know, we need to own all the shadow parts of ourselves. So what he does is he, you know, he goes to, you know, he'll talk to these voices that I, Kelly, my personality, like Robert Bly talks about, I put these parts of myself in the basement or in the bag. Mm. And I don't, I don't want, I don't want them coming and rearing their heads because I I have a reputation to uphold. <laughs> I don't want my murderous rage to show no, up. It's not. This is, right? Yeah. Because I'm a, I'm a loving, smart, you know, good human being. But when he, when he gives you permission in these sessions to talk to murderous rage mm. and you find out that murderous rage has been down there since, you know, age two, knows, the first yeah. time someone took a toy away from you. Right. And you right. wanted to kill somebody. You start to have a dialogue with this and you and it actually because it's being seen and heard, right. it starts to become more embodied, more mature, and more included in the conversation. And the energy mm. or the eros is how Jung would talk about right, it. Right. The, the the life force that ho- is held inside of that perspective gets reintegrated into the whole of the personality. That's the most important part because I I can tell you this. This is something that happened to me uh, last year. I all of a sudden, um, I got uh, like a pain in my arm, like a stabbing pain. <clears throat> and I was like, oh, you know, I think I pulled a muscle in my neck. I was doing some lifting. So I went to the doctor. I went to the doctor and he's like, yeah, you uh, took some x-rays. It looks like you may have like a herniated disc or something. And that, that's maybe what it is. So he's like, okay, you know, here's Valium for muscle relaxing and, you know, just take some rest and here's some steroids and it'll make it better. Took the steroids for two weeks, took the Valium, never taken Valium before. <laughs> Calmed me down. Definitely was like, I, you know what I actually did? Is I, I watched for two weeks um, all of uh, Battlestar Galactic. Galactica, <laughs> laying down, but I was still getting the stabbing. It was great, great show. Um, so I, uh, you know, after two weeks, still have the stabbing thing. Basically, it's getting worse to the point where I basically have to lie down, like you know, like eight hours Ooh. a day. So two people start recommending me a book, and it's called "The Mind Over Back Pain" was one of them, and uh, it's by this guy John Sarno. And his, I think I've heard of this guy. Yeah, yeah. And this was this was, and at this point, if someone told me hey, this may be something in your mind, I'd be like, fuck you. Yeah, you're an asshole. Exactly. Like, how dare you? Like, yes. I'm not a, I may be crazy in other ways, but I'm not crazy this way. Anyway, so I get the book. My dad ends up recommending to it. Someone I respect professionally recommends it. Someone on Facebook recommend, recommends it. So I'm like, okay. Fine, yeah, I'll again. read it. Ugh. So I read it. <laughs> And the first thing, and I'm more of a Jungian, and I recognize a huge split between Freud and Jung, but the book is very much based on Freudian concepts. Um, one of the most important is this concept of unconscious rage, exactly mm-hmm. what you're talking about, exactly mm-hmm. to the T that when you're young, you know, so you get a toy taken away, your mom says you can't have this, your dad says you can't have that, you have this irrational, <laughs> ah, you're going to scream, you're going to throw a tantrum. As you get older, uh, some people do this in public, I've seen them, but Yes. Many of us do not choose to engage like that in public. We have to put it somewhere and we repress it and we repress it and we put it down and we forget about it in the basement. So the book's basic premise is, is that there's a part of your brain and mind and part of this is physiological and part of it is just a psychic occurrence that basically rather than experience that rage, which is so unacceptable to the rational part of your psyche, uh, it is going to manifest in what people experience as lower back pain, as back mm. pain, as these stabbing pains. And he said he was a clinical. He had, he had no interest in studying the psychology behind it. He was a clinician. Um, yeah. And he basically studied, you know, had 10,000 patients 
and came to the idea that what I think this is, is really just a way for us not to experience these things. There's a physiological process that has to do with oxygen de deprivation and wow. the way to kind of resolve. And that's what you're feeling, this intense yeah. pain. Because he, he was saying physiologically, like if a, you go to a doctor and they say you have a herniated disc and your arm is getting tingly. He's like, if you really had something pushing up against a bundle of nerves, you'd lose feeling in that arm. Like it wouldn't be off and on and kind of like weird, like, oh, it happened because of this. And he says, the part of your mind that's consciously aware knows that this is going on. So when you do a funny movement or you ran too much in a day, it latches onto that as an excuse for you to start experiencing uh -huh. the pain. And he basically talks people through this, through lectures. Anyway, huh. I'm reading the book. And one of the techniques is, you know, when you experience the pain psychologically, start thinking about things that may, may be related to. List your stressors down on a piece of paper. Take five to ten minutes of, you know, contemplation to either think of it or just what could be going on. So I'm reading this book, and I've been basically laid out for almost two months now. And uh, I and I was going through a lot of, like, stressful work stuff. I mean, there couldn't have been more obvious why I might be experiencing unconscious rage. Um, I start reading the book. And there comes a point in the book where he goes, for a very small percentage of people, um, once their conscious mind kind of latches onto this concept, the pain will start to move around the body. And sure enough, as I'm reading this, the pain starts like shooting to my right side of my body, to my neck, to my back, all over the place. I'm like, holy fucking shit. I'm like, this is the scariest thing ever. And this, and long story short, I once in a while will get a little twinge somewhere and I'll kind of know what it is. His broader theory, and this is why I think it's cool, is he thinks that almost all immuno, you know, immune diseases, cancers, things like that, he's not making this claim you know, exactly, but he's basically saying this stuff, all of these illnesses that we experience, yes, they can be physiologically brought on by what we eat and what we do, but this stuff is also repressed emotions. There's mm -hmm. stuff in our psyche that this is the psyche and matter thing. It influences yes. our physical structure. And so yes. when we have something like- How could it not? How could I mean, it not, right? But yeah. and like we know that like I'm Mr. Mind over Matter guy. I believe you can manifest things if you do it in the right way with the right intention. But when I was getting this pain, what did I do exactly? Immediately <laughs> went to the doctor and was like, oh, I need a you know, give me Valium and steroids. So it's it's one of these things that I think the more we kind of have techniques for dealing with those types of things in our psyche and in our world, um, the more we discuss them and more we kind of just get it out there, maybe we can start shifting some of the paradigms that exist with these things. Um, so I want to, yeah. Wanna, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and just briefly to sum up too, like, yeah. you know, ultimately mind body there is no difference yeah it it's just two different experiences of the same thing That's it's right. you know it probably is chemicals and peptides and and energy and all this kind of stuff and the thing about doing the process whatever kind of process you end up doing around yeah. this stuff is that by learning to language it and yes. finding words to express it yes. is moves it beyond the body then. It becomes logos. Right. It becomes an, a, a thing that is concretized and then yes. can be understood in that way. But, you know, and sometimes it's not words, though, but sometimes it's movement or dance or painting. Or any I mean, music, any, anything, any kind yeah. of, yes, any kind of active imagination process where you can just express, mm. you know, and sometimes it's nonverbal, but if... But if you can get it to words, that's great too. But sometimes like Marion Woodman's work is very nonverbal. It's all mm. movement, mask making, mm. uh, you know, myth storytelling in the, mm. in the sense that it's, it's words, but it's more about the metaphor and the archetypes right. and things like that. And, you know, so it's, it's, you know, it's about recognizing that there's many ways in right. and many ways to release, that's you know, and it's, it's about experimenting and finding the way that kind of really can work in your day for you. That to me is, I mean, that's my endless pursuit so far of my life is figuring out exactly how to language it or put it away. So I wanted to to shift with that as a segue. Sure. Talk about the process of writing your autobiography here. For, you know, Carlin Home Companion, for people who don't know, you wrote an, an incredible book. I'm about halfway through it. Um, really, I mean, talk about soul bearing. I mean, this is great. I love reading stuff like this because you can see like everything on the paper that was going on in your life. And what was that process like? Um, you don't have to go into specifics of, you know, what exactly you were doing, but 
what is the process like from like a soul level or just like from a consciousness level writing something like that? Because I'm sure a lot of people have thought like, hey, I'm going to write a, a book. Uh, it's going to be interesting. But you did it. And I'm sure it was uh, an experience. So I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, it's ultimately been a 15 year experience wow, because yeah. 15 years ago is when I wrote my first solo show and wanted mm -hmm. to share these stories with the world, um, mostly because I was a I'm a survivor of a lot of interesting things <laughs> and a lot of ordinary universal things too. Mm -hmm. um, parents who were uh, struggled with addiction, mm -hmm. uh, abusive relationships, uh, finding lost as an artist in a in a in a world that wants you to be corporate. Um, also just, uh, being, uh, having panic attack disorder right. and overcoming that, having, uh, having a parent die now two parents. Um, but you know, just a lot of kind of universal things. And I, I so I had survived a lot of things and I wanted to talk about that. Mm. Um, this is part of my extroverted feeler thing <laughs> that I, yeah. that I understand now. And part of what inspired me originally to want, even want to do the, an art form like this was a gentleman named Spalding Gray, hmm. who uh, was a storyteller. And he did a, a great show called um, Swimming to Cambodia, which ended up being a film of, of him storytelling, uh, directed by Jonathan Demme. Another one called Monster in a Box about him trying to write a screenplay. Hmm. And this is a man who went on stage and <clears throat> just poured out his soul on hmm. stage. His neurosis, his insanity, his crazy thoughts, but he was very <laughs> funny and he was yeah. a great storyteller. And it made me feel less alone in the world when I saw him. Hmm. I saw him in my late 20s and it changed everything for me. Uh, very, very, very different than what my dad did on stage. You know, I look at my dad and my dad is definitely more of a thinking type mm. and lives from his head exclusively. Mm. And, you know, they say you live out the shadow of your parents. So it's no wonder that I, I was, the, <laughs> I was, I'm the feeler type yeah. and that I want to talk about everything that goes on inside of me in my life. Whereas my dad wants to talk about great ideas and relate them all to, you know, the world outside, right, right, even right. though they were experiences that sometimes he had, it was, he was much more, you know, talking about the world out there. Right. So, so that's part of it. And then, um, I did a lot of dancing around telling my stories in, in a bigger form and really had to wait for my dad to be no longer here for me to feel like mm. I had the full freedom to do it. Got it. Um, because, because of the nature of who he was and it just made him feel, yeah. uncomfortable. feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Um, which you'll get to in that part of the book if you haven't yet. But know, um, but the actual writing of it and finally getting to share it publicly um, has been – well, the writing was great. I love writing. Yeah. I love sitting in my house. It's the introverted part of me. I'm pretty much exactly half extrovert, half introvert sure. on my Myers-Briggs. So sure. <laughs> I need a little of both in my life. And I loved being in my house and just writing – um, I love the creative process. I love solving create, you know, the, uh, the creative problem, yeah. you know, how do I, how do I know, I know what I wanted to, I'm, I can feel it in my yeah. body somatically before I yeah, that's the best. get it out there, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, like I'm working on a speech right now and I can feel where I want the ending to go now. And, right. you know, I worked on it for about a, a 45 minutes today and I knew I just got to let it cook a little bit more. I got to walk away from it. So when I come tomorrow, it'll be fresh again. And right. just, I love that process, finding the right word, the right phrase, the right, the right way to, to bring something together, to bring people along, right. um, which I know I got from my dad, watching my dad my whole life on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, he really trained me in how to bring people along to a logical conclusion that they weren't expecting to go to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he did it purely oh, yeah. for the sake of humor. Um, but because of the topics he, wor he worked on, he was also changing minds and really shifting people's consciousness yes. on big, Still big to this yeah. day, to I mean, this day, I to this can't day. Tell you yeah. how many times I'll see it just from, you know, people I admire and respect. And my the first person to ever turned me on to George Carlin was my grandma. And she was just like, You gotta see this. Oh, and, that is awesome. Oh, yeah, she was she was the coolest. And uh I was just like blown away, like from the cultural things. Like my one of my favorite things your dad said was, you know, when everyone's talking about, you know, 
are we, are we going to be here? And he's like, the, the earth is going to be fine. Like whatever yeah. we do to it, it doesn't matter. It's a self-correcting organism. We may yeah. be fucked. And We're I, screwed. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. I love that. That's yeah. just so and the, genius. And the, yeah. And oh. the, and the environmentalists hated him for that because, <laughs> right. you know, he was saying, yeah, you can recycle, but you know, <laughs> think about what the earth has been through, exactly. you know, she'll figure out what to do with plastic, exactly. you know, she'll figure it out. You know, and, and then of course the climate deniers now grab onto him and say, see, he, he right, didn't right. even believe in it. it. I'm like, no, dudes, don't you understand? <laughs> he was still completely against industry and pollution. I mean, come on, don't be a fucking idiot. I know. It's just so funny. That's but so funny. but so anyway, and then now having it done, I mean, think about it. It's a 15 yeah, years geez. I've been wanting to tell the story. Seven uh, years ago, my dad died. Yeah. I've been, I stepped into doing a solo show about this material with Paul Provenza as my director. That's been an incredible experience. And now that it's out there, it's been out for October, November, December, January, uh, five months, yeah. uh, which is kind of mind boggling to me that it's been five months, um, <laughs> that it's, um, it's, I'm, I'm excited because I feel like who I was after leaving Pacifica in 2004. And I'd spent about four years after that, two of them being a therapist and then two really kind of stepping into the coaching world Mm. and the and leadership training world. And really from, you know, part of it to just be able to see what was outside of the psychological clinical aspect, you know, because working clinically with people, is a very specific thing, you know, especially if you're a Jungian. Yeah, yeah. And and it's, you know, and you're working with, you know, people with very deep suffering and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to learn, once again, balance, tension of the opposites. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn techniques where I didn't have to just always be about holding the safe space for someone. I also wanted to learn how to kick people in the ass. Which is super i am i have learned this lesson more in the past two years of my life than i think i, I everything else combined that's such a you know i've been uh, a t- uh two guests ago by the time this one comes out david nick turn buddhist teacher i interviewed and we were talking about you know he studied with uh, chogyam trungpa and mm-hmm. one of my favorite things that chogyam trungpa talks about is idiot compassion where yes you're basically you know and this is a long line of the spiritual pie bass stuff like yes. you don't want to be a dummy there's a way to be compassionate and firm there's a way yes and that is very important for people to remember because uh it's balancing just like and that's and that's the that's the greatness i think of the great buddhist teachers Mm. and especially the zen masters is you know there's there's an ass kicking that goes on that's (laughs) essential for your own enlightenment and and so those two years that i did that i encountered some great teachers in that world that really kicked me out of my slumber in Mm. some ways for me to really step into you know kind of the big thing i'm here to do on the planet you know and and to own that energy which is a terrifying energy for someone who Mm. a grew up in the shadow of someone who was doing great things on the planet and who, you know, I'm, you know, I've always been taught to be humble and not arrogant, (laughs) but there's a certain moment where you have to kind of own something in yourself. You have to own your vision and your power and your gifts and know that if you don't use them, you know, that's the sin of your life. It's a waste. It is. It's a waste. It is. It is. It's, and, it's and the that, concept and, of individuation or actualizing, like you get that's yes. that well, that's what kind of wanted I didn't want to, you know, I don't want to ask the big question like what's the meaning of life, but that's kind of where I go with it. I mean, I I outside of everyone's personal journey and what their specific path is, is I mean, I've come to the conclusion, at least in my life, that I, my particular skills and talents, whatever they be in any area, I like to help people and whatever yes. that is, whether it's yes. feeling people, well, we're feeling, helping people feel better, whether it's showing someone, teaching something, whatever is going to be the best synthesis of that uh, is what I, I tend to like to do. Yeah. And, and the, the key is with that, which is something I think you talked about at the beginning here, which yeah. is also, you can't be attached to the outcome, though. <laughs> no, though, do not be attached to the fruits of your labor. That's and the, even yeah. even the outcome, are we going to save the planet? Right, right. I mean, that's the terrifying one to really let go of because, um, you know, I mean, I, you know, when I was first introduced to Integral and 
all this kind of stuff. And, and even, you know, being a therapist, and everything, it's like, let's heal the world. Let's mm. fix the world. Mm. Let's, you know, uh, how do I, how do I get people to jump from, you know, kind of orange materialist capital to, to green community <laughs> and then to integral, you know, and Don Beck, who like teaches all this stuff, looked at me and he said, why are you trying to make anything happen? Like, well, that's not your job. And I'm right. like, but it is, I have to make consciousness change. And he's like, wow, that sounds really exhausting. Yes. And so, and that's, and so once again, the tension of those particular opposites is, so in one hand, you have to hold, I'm here to change the world and we can do it. And in the other hand, you have to hold, I can't change anything. That's right. Well, that's... And when you hold both of those things at the same time and honor the truth and the value of both of them and the importance of them, mm -hmm. something, a third way is created where you are engaged, but detached, you are loving and full of love and connected and fully on board. And at the same time, know that none of it is ultimately under our personal purview or yeah. ego strength or any of that. Yeah. And that part of it is, you know, being both, being attached and unattached. I, and I've found like the grasping and aversion concept, right? That's essentially what it is, the middle way. That's what Buddhism yep. teaches there. I've noticed paradoxically uh, when you can actually maintain that, the state of flow, the Tao, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, things tend to kind of manifest and maybe what your your intentions start to align with the outcome. And I have noticed the other thing. Um, do not be attached to the fruits of your labor. That's incredibly yeah. important. But I like as an at uh, as an antidote to that uh, gratitude. That's usually yes. how I. Yes, beautiful. It's beautiful. a it's a nice little slick little trick I picked up. You can you can make everything good if you're just grateful for it. It's a little little tricky trick. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. And one. and in the end, you know, I mean, it's I've had a few glimpses of this in working with Genpo Roshi, mm. where we get a chance to. Um, understand and have that uh, that enormous sense of enlightenment mm. and being connected to the Buddha nature mm. and transcendence and oneness and seeing everything as that. And then at the same time, living in an ordinary life and that you have to get up and you have to brush your teeth and I have That's to right. wash my hair again today and all of that. And really seeing, I've had a few glimpses of it mm. where there really is no difference between the two. Oh, not at all. The sacred is in the mundane. Well, okay. Yeah. I wanna... and, it's a, and it's a concept that all of us can agree on, but to really fucking feel that, <laughs> to really feel it and be in it is an extraordinary moment. And, I, and I've, like I said, I've had a few glimpses. I get lucky every once in a while and the glimpse comes around again yeah. and I try not to grasp at it. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. but to really get that, all this seeking is for naught mm -hmm. because it's all really is. This is it, folks. That's really this is it. I, I I'm hoping we all can become more aware of that as time goes on collectively. So I wanna end just with a couple of little this has been so much fun, yes. by the way. <laughs> this has time. been great. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um are, just to end it to tip to bring it back into the quote unquote real world, are you reading or listening to any music right now or recently that you would like to let the listeners know about that I can put some linkies to? Um, um I haven't I haven't fully deepened into it, but Lucinda Williams has a new album yeah, out. Yeah. And that. big fan of hers, gotten a chance to hang out with her a little bit before. Cool. Uh, so that's going to be my thing that I'm going to deepen into probably this week. So that's, that's what I'm, I'm into. Like literally this morning I was on Facebook. <laughs> There's a blog that she's writing, uh, uh, Tom, her husband's writing about each track about cool. the process of making the track oh, cool. and what it means to Lucinda. So <laughs> check that out on Facebook too. Go to Lucinda's um, public page and you'll Avalanche. see those blogs. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, Kelly, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. This was great fun. Yeah, it was awesome. So then, in music, though, one doesn't make the end of a composition. The point of the composition, of the composition. If that were so, the best conductors would be those who play fastest.
and there will be composers who wrote only finales. <laughs> People go to concert just to hear one crashing chord, because that's the end. <laughs> Same way in dancing. You don't aim at a particular spot in the room. That's where you should arrive. The whole point of the dancing is the dance. Now, but we don't see that as uh, something brought by our education into our everyday conduct. We've got a system of schooling which gives a completely different impression. It's all graded. And what we do is we put the child into the corridor of this grade system with a kind of, come on, kitty, kitty, kitty. And now yeah, you go to kindergarten, you know. And that's a great thing because when you finish that, you'll get into first grade. And then, come on, the first grade leads to second grade and so on. And then you get out of grade school, you go to high school. And it's revving up, the thing is coming. Then you're going to go to college. And by Jove, then you get into graduate school. And when you're through with graduate school, you go out and join the world. And then you get into some racket where you're selling insurance. And they've got that quota to pay. And you're going to make that. And all the time, this thing is coming. It's coming. It's coming. That great thing, the, the success you're working for. Then when you wake up one day about 40 years old, you say, my God, I have arrived. I have arrived. I have arrived. <laughs> I'm there. And you don't feel very different from what you always felt. And there's a slight letdown because you feel there's a hoax. And there was a hoax. A dreadful hoax. They made you miss everything. By expectation. Look at the people who live to retire. And put those savings, put those away. savings away. Then when they're 65, they don't have any energy left. They're more or less impotent. And uh, they go and run in an old people's senior citizens' community. <laughs> because we simply cheated ourselves the whole way down the line. We thought of life by analogy with a journey, with a pilgrimage, which had a serious purpose at the end. The thing was to get to that end. Success or whatever it is, or maybe heaven after your death. But we missed the point the whole way along. It was a musical thing, and you were supposed to sing or to dance while the music was being played.